Mid-America Furniture's new location, 7546 North Milwaukee Avenue in Chicago. Mid-America Furniture, special prices for the holidays, now specials on sofas, sleepers, and Ashley mattresses, new collection on dining tables, and bedrooms starting at $6.99. Mid-America Furniture, we're going to have a new the Ministry of the Signature by Ashley, Millennium, Benchcraft, Sierra Sleep, Coaster, Jackson, Catnapper, Global Furniture, USA, Pulaski. It's new financing available, line of furniture, 50% off. Monday through Saturday from 10 to 6, who Sunday, ask for Mr. G for an extra 5% off. Mid America Furniture, 773-761-2106. You know, what I'm going to talk about a little is some is stuff you've already kind of heard bits and pieces about. I'm, I'm going to talk a little more about how it comes out in treatment and also how it comes out in your everyday life. Um, so you heard a little bit about my history, my, my professional history, and uh, the, the thing that I, and even talking with the esteemed panelists here, I, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, I've, I've spoken in front of large groups and in front of the media, small groups, professionals, all these different aspects, and yet these are the events that I'm most nervous at, just to be completely honest with you. Um, so you know about my professional history, I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I'm nervous uh, at these events. So maybe I won't be as nervous, we'll see. But 20 years in the field, a lot more in the community. You know, this is my community, this is my family, the people sitting here uh, mean the world to me. And, and I want to thank, and we've already thanked Mud Polis, the uh, Kasha that are here, uh, Shiva uh, Mendo also for helping us secure this event and letting us be here. But I really want to thank all the rest of you, too, for coming and making this an important event. Because this is an important event. I, I was born to the church. My, my parents were involved in Assyrian communities. My aunts were involved, still are involved in, in many different things. I, I met my wife in the church. I grew up in the youth. Um, this is my community. And it's one thing to go to work, and, and I'm not heartless, obviously. I see people suffering, I feel bad, and, and I feel compassion and sympathy and empathy for it. But then I see it hit close to home, and it takes a whole different meaning for me. So when I'm asked to be here, I jump at the chance. And that's why this is where I'm most nervous. Addiction is a disease, 100%. It is a disease. It's a devastating disease. I've been in the field for 19 years. I have heard more people dying who have gone through treatment in the last five than I did in the 14 years before. It's escalating. It's moving quickly. The thing that really gets to me is, as you saw with uh, Dr. Guliana's presentation, that addiction is by far, not even close, the leading cause of accidental death in the United States. By far. And what devastates me about that is that it is treatable and it is preventable. And yet, it's still killing more, um, more Americans accidentally than anything else. So we have to focus on it. We have to look at it. We have to talk about it. That's the big thing. So, you know, I, I, here we're, gonna, we're focusing a lot on heroin. That's important. It's really important. I want to pull back from that for a minute and say you cannot forget about other drugs. Alcohol remains the most deadly substance of use and abuse. It's affecting more people and, and, and killing people. It's still the number one substance. Marijuana is another one. And, and the reason I talk about marijuana isn't because, oh, what's harder, this or that, or should it be legal? I don't get into that conversation. The fact is, the marijuana we're talking about now is not the marijuana that all the science has studied. It's not the marijuana from the 70s or 80s. This is a different kind of weed, is what it is. We're talking about marijuana that's easily 30 times more potent than it's ever been, ever, at least. And the scary thing about it isn't how potent it is, it's how accepted it is. People don't feel like it's harmful because their friends have been harmed by it. And that's where it can be devastating. In itself, and also as a gateway to other drugs. We talked a little bit about how we got to this point, how we got to the opiate epidemic. I don't have any science to prove this, but my gut, my clinical gut, tells me that our cultural acceptance of marijuana has spearheaded this movement too. In the past, when when uh, an adolescent or a you know, teenager or young adult wants to rebel, they'd smoke some weed. 
But if that need is, is the stuff that you're getting from your parents, or your parents have accepted it, it's not enough. It's not rebelling anymore. So we have to up the game. That's the terrifying part of it. But I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to bring it back to, to heroin. Also, we're focusing a lot on the youth. We need to focus a lot on the youth. I see it's like the whole youth group has shown up, and I, I don't know if you guys are over there, but definitely in this crowd, I see a bunch of you. Um, the fact is, as I pull back, it's not, this is not just a youth disease. I don't want parents and, and loved ones to walk out of here thinking, we gotta really watch our youth. Yes, you do, but watch each other, watch your parents, watch senior citizens. Everybody is being affected by this. When we talk about the youth, and this is what, what the, the presenters before me identified, when we talk about the youth, the primary place they're getting their drugs, their pain medication especially, is from the home, is from the friends. It's not from the street or the internet. I mean, that becomes the way. But, and, and look, I'm, I'm a Syrian. I grew up in a Syrian household. I know how it is. I get this prescription. I put it in my fridge. I use some of it, and the rest stays there. For me, if I need it later, or God forbid, I become a pharmacist for my friends, and, and it's like, oh, you have pain? I've got this. That is causing a lot of this drive, too. There are ways to dispose of this. If you have a prescription, and the time of that prescription is passed, or your need for that prescription is passed, get rid of them. Don't throw them out. Don't flush them down the toilet. There are ways to do it. Uh, you know, they, we've got information at one of the tables back there. You know, the water reclamation plant on Howard, which everyone knows, because you smell it whenever you drive by it, you can go take them there, and they will get rid of it for you. You can go to pharmacies, and they will help you, or at least at the very least, help direct you. It, so the first thing I want you to take away is do not keep medication especially addictive medication, in your house beyond when you need it and, and when it's prescribed, by the way. So that's the biggest thing I want to put out right, right in the front. I want to go back to the disease concept that Dr. Guyana talked about. This is not about weak will. It's not about moral failure. It's not. This is a disease. Yes, the person is making the initial decision to use, but for some people right away, for some people it takes time, eventually that decision is gone. And the thing I want to point out about addiction and how devastating and how powerful it is, is that it, it comes down to your priorities. Addiction is a, is a substance, it is, is a disease, I'm sorry, is a disease that starts knocking at your priorities one by one, climbing over them. But once it reaches the top of your priority list, unlike other things, other things you love passionately, that's not enough. It then has to eliminate everything below it. So when we're talking about an addict and how they think, and how could they do this to their family? The, the thing is, it's not, I love my drug more than I love my family. Eventually, it's, I love my drug, period. There's no thought beyond that. That's how strong this disease can be. You know, the, we, we talked about spirituality, and, and I, I'm going to briefly touch on that, too. A lot of people in, in treatment struggle with the concept of spirituality. Some because they never really were born into it. Some because maybe they, as they grew up, they kind of have rebelled against, against religion as a concept. Spirituality for many people, many people in this room, for myself included, is my religion. The easy way I try to translate it is that it's connection. At the very end of the day, it's connection that you have to something larger than yourself. Your family is part of that. And, and I say that because for a lot of people, it can be religion, but even just going to church isn't enough. There, there are some people that will go to church, and you know, you, you know the prayers, you know the songs, you recite them, but it's more like routine. That's not getting in touch with your spirituality. That's getting in the habit. That's good. Don't get me wrong. That's an important first step, but eventually it has to be something personal. Your prayers, your songs have to be a connection that you have with your higher power, with God. So I, I really want to point that out. It's not just about going through the motions. This is all about connecting deeper. I'm going to talk a little bit about how, you know, what a loved one can do. If you have somebody struggling with addiction and, and they're willing to go to treatment, that's incredible. That's fantastic. Don't wait. Move. Move right away. There are so many ways you can, you can find information. You can go online. There's a, a group that creates a treatment facility locator. You can put in whatever you want. Zip code. Do they take insurance? Not. And it will throw out a bunch of it. Uh, bunch of things for you. Uh, again, on the table back there, there's like a, a piece of paper that's about a third of a page. It's got that website on it. Grab that. Grab it. And what you do is you find the treatment center and you call them. 
they take you for an assessment, and they identify what level of care. And sometimes it's residential where you go away. You know, everyone's heard about the concept of 28 days, 30 days. Insurance won't let that happen as much now as it used to, but, but you may go away to residential, or you may be able to just do it in outpatient. The thing I want to say is if you're going away to residential, that's great because it takes you out of your everyday routine. It takes you out of all the negative patterns that have developed around you and puts you in a place where you can focus. That's important, and you will do well but what I've seen a lot of times is people get, get very, uh, very cocky with that. They say, I'm doing great. Things are great. I'm just going to go home. And they don't pursue outpatient treatment. And they don't pursue counseling. They don't pursue psychiatric care for medication-assisted treatment. And they certainly don't do any kind of 12-step sober support network. And they just go home thinking, I just got 30 days. I'm good. They relapse. They relapse because they go back into their everyday environment and slowly the old habits come back and take over. So residential treatment is not enough. It needs to be followed up. There's got to be intensive outpatient continuing care. I keep bringing back the concept of sober support networks. 12-step is the most common. AA, you guys may have heard of that, but there are others. But that's a must. It's great to have a supportive family network. It's crucial to have a supportive family network. But family can only support, support so far. They don't know what it's like to live in early recovery, much less longer recovery. We need a guide. We need guides that can help us walk through the path of recovery, and that's what 12-step support is. And again, those resources are on that table as well. There's a lot of resources on that table. Beyond that, you know, I, I kind of take it back to some of the comments we heard. Individual counseling, psychotherapy, uh, psychiatry is important. Family counseling. It's another thing I hear a lot is, here's my loved one, they're struggling with addiction, go fix them. That doesn't work. Addiction is a family disease, and by that I mean that, yes, there is the individual who's struggling with addiction, and their lives have changed, the way they act has changed, but what we're not talking about is the family is a system, which means everybody in that family is affected by that change, and, and what they want is they want balance, just like anything else. If you're standing on a, on a platform and, and, and you start to lose your balance, what do you do? You throw your arms out to the side and you try to regain your balance. Systems are like that too. Families are like that too. An addict in a family throws the family off balance. And the rest of the family changes and adapts, not in healthy ways usually, to, to that. And if you take somebody out of that, get them in a healthy place, and then put them back in a system that's all messed up, they will go back. So the family needs to get its own care. And there's a lot of options. Family counseling, family programming, addiction treatment centers will have family programming as well. So that's important to do. Now, what if your loved one isn't interested or, or denies it? That's a problem. That's a huge problem that a lot of people face. Interventionists are an idea, and uh, they're costly. Insurance doesn't pay for them, unfortunately. But the key to an interventionist, and, and I'm really going to play this out because it plays into my next point, is if you think about it, they spend you know, days, weeks, months even with a family. But an interventionist doesn't just sit there, and, and I, you guys have probably seen, some of you have seen the TV shows, that's not, you, you're, you're only seeing the juicy parts, right? You're only seeing the part where the interventionist is talking to the actual addict. The fact is 90% of the time an interventionist works with you, they're working with the family. They haven't interacted with the addict once. They're getting the family ready. They're getting the family to get honest and open and share their feelings and, and write it down and plan it, and then they meet with the, the person who's struggling with the disease. Because the reality is, when an interventionist is called in, it's usually because the family is more motivated than the person struggling. And this is the part of my job that I think is the hardest, because it's the part that families hate to hear. If you're more motivated than your loved one who's struggling with the disease, I don't know if I can get them into care, but you certainly need to do something. Family programming and counseling is key. That's where you learn, am I enabling, am I setting healthy boundaries? What can I do next? I need support too, because that's the important thing. You're, we get so focused on our loved one that we forget that we need support. Those of you that have been on airplanes, the thing that I keep going back to is if you're flying on a plane and you're flying with a small child and they say, you know, cabin depressurizes, oxygen masks fall, they will tell you one thing, and they say it because they know they need to. Put your mask on first before you help your child. Because our natural reaction, my reaction as a dad, I'm going to be struggling with my kid's mask. But if I pass out, I'm no good to anybody. Take care of yourselves first, or you're no good to anybody that you're trying to help. I can't stress that enough. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Narcan. You know, that was one thing that we, we will probably touch on uh, a little bit later. It's, it's important if, you, if your family member is struggling with, with opiate disorder, 
Narcan is a, is a huge, important key to this. The catch is, it doesn't solve it. If somebody's overdosing and you give them Narcan, they seem like they're out of the woods, it's a half hour, 30 minutes at best. Get them to a hospital. Don't just stop. Signs and symptoms, you saw the signs and symptoms. I, I, I really have a hard time talking about this too because the signs and symptoms, what are they? Well, somebody's too happy, too sad, too depressed, too, too awake, too alert, too tired. It's everywhere. What I'm gonna tell you is know your loved ones, get involved with your loved ones. If you see any change in their behavior or their attitude, any change, get involved. Let them be angry with you. Let them get annoyed with you. That's fine. Angry and safe, angry and alive, is way better than enabled content and dying. Be involved, speak up. And I, I say that because our culture is an incredible one. We've gone through a lot, we've, we've been around for a long time, and we have a great deal of pride, which is amazing, but you know what? The drawback is we have a great deal of pride, which is hurtful too. We cannot let aibala or shame or anything like that get in the way. If you're worried about you know, in social media, you mentioned it, it's kind of escalated things. If you're worried about shimma, this, that, or the other thing, you're going to hold on to that while your loved one dies. It's not that important. There is no shame in a disease. We have to understand that if this is a disease, then there is no shame to it. So how do we how do we solve this? How do we get through this? It's one important thing. This is a disease that lives in shame and in secrecy. If you turn the light off on it, you don't look at it, it's going to grow and grow and grow and people will die. Turn the light on. Speak up. Share it with others. Share it with your family members. Get all the people you need to involve. Let everyone know what's going on. You have a message because you're dealing with either your own substance use or family members. Spread that message because even if it doesn't help your family member, you're saving someone's life. That's the biggest thing I can tell you, is don't be quiet, speak up, get involved. That's all I got. Thank you. Our next speaker is Officer George Brabanian. He's a Chicago Police Officer with 20 years of service. He's also the president of the Eastern American Police Association, which was established in 2004. George? Um, on behalf of the Eastern American Police Association, I want to thank you guys for coming. Um, we've talked to uh, some of the youth groups before. Um, I've made this years ago. Um, a lot of these I've made in the back there. Again, they're all fake. They're just to look like uh, the narcotics that we deal with on the street. So I use this with as an example when I talk to um, some of the youth. Search warrants um, on the Syrians' homes. It's not something just to show them these know, are narcotics. These are the drugs about, that we're dealing with. Some of the things that your friend's family might be dealing with. Um, so the question is, is how does somebody get started um, with becoming an addict? So to put it real simple, and it sounds like an infomercial, for 10 bucks you can become an addict. It's sad that most of these drugs and the little samples that are back there will cost you 10 bucks. Uh, a hit, a pill, a uh, tinfoil, a heroin, for $10, you can get started on your way to becoming a drug addict. Um, the sad thing is, is sometimes it doesn't even cost you a dime because our friends, our families, our loved ones are getting our community involved in drugs. Um, they're sharing drugs. They're, they're uh, our own Assyrians are selling to other Assyrians. So that's something that we need to uh, acknowledge here. Uh, some of these slides, I'm just going to kind of go through them real quick. Just wanted to show some of the family members. These are some of the drugs that we're dealing with. Um, obviously, weed. There's crack cocaine, heroin, uh, crystal meth. Unfortunately, I've probably arrested an Assyrian for almost every one of these drugs here. Uh, if you don't think that our community is doing these things, think again. Um, I've done search warrants on Assyrians' homes. It's not something we're you know, proud of or we're happy about. But if you're selling, if you're dealing, if you're uh, using drugs and you're driving around, you get stopped uh, driving and you've got drugs on you, you're gonna get arrested. You know, it's that simple. So, unsure if some family members have seen these things. Again, if you wanna take a closer look um, of the samples we have back there on the table, uh, these are things you might find in your kids' rooms. Um, in the car, and again, I don't want to make this 
just about the kids because there are adults that I've arrested who are doing these drugs too. Um, vapes, all sorts of different, that's uh, weed wax. There's edibles, that's something to keep a lookout for for kids. They're targeting kids now. Uh, they look like gummy bears and uh, candies, uh, brownies. They're bringing them to school. Um, I remember probably we can talk about it when we're a little older, but you didn't see this in seventh, eighth, ninth grade, you know, maybe later in, in high school, but now even, uh, you know, seventh graders are seeing this stuff, the vapes and everything else. That's crack cocaine, um, crack pipe. I mean, these are things that unfortunately our Syrians are getting involved with. We're not excluded from this whole drug addiction. Xanax, that's one of the main things I see a lot on, a, our, on our youth. Um, and again, I don't want to keep saying youth, but our loved ones, let's say, um, adults. Prescription pills, Molly. Um, these are also made to look like candy. Um, you know these club drugs. So, real quick, uh, I just kind of want to go over a few things, and I think the panel was great. It'd be great if I can just say say no to drugs, and we're done, right? It'd be nice to say that to you guys. You know. You do drugs, you sell drugs, you have drugs on you. If you're a drug addict, you get caught, you go to jail. That should be enough, right? You would hope that the idea of going to prison, going to jail, getting your car impounded, getting your door kicked in, uh, conducting a search warrant, that would be enough for you guys to say, you know what, I don't want to get involved in that kind of stuff. But unfortunately, like I said, a lot of family members are getting uh, our own people involved in drugs. Um, be it the ten dollars they're using to go buy some or their cousin loved one whoever gives them drugs and then they start using and abusing and next thing you know um, the addiction is a disease now a disease to me is something more like a cancer right but once you've become addicted this is not you know popping a pill every now and then you're dependent on that uh, uh, narcotic it's like a disease, and then the doctors have uh, talked about how you've got to treat it like a disease, like a cancer, okay? Um, it is affecting our Syrian community where I, I'm seeing it more and more, and we talked about how it's more acceptable. Kids are smoking weed like it's nothing. You know, it's like a cigarette. But if you think about the gateway drugs, the underage drinking, the underage smoking, um, popping pills, some of those uh, things that we've seen, um, they're doing that and it's more acceptable. But in the long run, sooner or later, they end up doing more harder drugs. Harder drugs being uh, cocaine, heroin, um, again, a tin foil of heroin, like this one here, that's 10 bucks. And once you hit that, you're done. Because I've never seen too many people come back from that uh, out on the street. Um, I know you guys have probably seen with a lot of help, but again, that's the whole community, the family, everybody rallying behind that person and trying to help them. When I see them out on the street, they're done. Repeat offenders getting arrested, um, other crimes that they commit to get that easy 10 bucks. They're out on the street working, doing things that we don't want to talk about just to get that $10 to get their next fix. Again, it's like an infomercial. For $10, you can become an addict. And that's sad to think, um, instead of going to church, taking that $10, putting it in the offering, and praying that you never try any one of these drugs. Even the younger kids, smoking weed, doing the vapes, that's not something that you think about now like, oh, I just tried it a few times. Well, it's going to turn into a habit. It's going to turn into other reasons to try other things. Um, so actually, I just want to let it go uh, now because we're going to have uh, someone else speak. All right, so I'll kind of cut my time so we can. Thank you, Joe. Can we please have one last round of applause for all of the okay? Thank you. Uh, next, we would like to ask a member of our community, Mr. Jeffrey Levy, to share his experience with addiction and recovery.
Hi guys, my name is Jeffrey Louis. Um, like everything you guys have read in like newspapers, I've been through it. Uh, just my story is a little different uh, through the grace of God and prayer. I'm here today with my doctor and my family. Uh, this started for me back in 2004. I was born and raised here in Chicago. Uh, come from a good family, great family. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, it's tough to talk about because my family's here, but uh, you know, Okay, so anyway, I was just started in 2004. I was working at Aero Financial Service through some friends. It was in collections. Didn't know what it was. Didn't know. Just thought it was from a doctor, so I thought it was safe. It was better than the drugs on the streets. Uh, became very addicting very fast. My blood got immune to it. I was ended up starting from one a day ended up taking 60 a day. That's 60,000 milligrams, over 1,700 pills a month. So, um, uh, my road to recovery has been hard, tough. This is my therapist right here, or was. Um, Two thousand four it started. I was working, and about nine months later, I lost my job. Hit depression, got worse and worse and worse. And what I'm trying to tell you guys is, I've lost a lot of friends through this. Like all my close friends, growing up, my best friends that I don't even see anymore. I'm the lucky one, you know. And I just want to let you guys know. It's an addiction that I'm going to have for the rest of my life because of my choices that I made. I went to rehab through my family. My mom came to me once and told me after the fact, 10 years after the fact, do I want to go to rehab? I told her I was, I looked at her and said, well, what were you waiting for? You know, basically I wanted to die, you know for a long time. I was embarrassed to look my family, my father, my cousins. Didn't go to Thanksgiving, Christmas, nothing for 10 years. Sorry. So now I see myself, now I see myself here today. And you know what? Even when it rains, there's sunshine in my life. And I'm really not a talker, but uh, about last month, Arizona had this, and my cousin was supposed to speak, and he ended up passing away, you know, and that bothered me, and I felt like he was a young 21-year-old kid, you know, and good-looking kid, too. Man. Anyway, it's just so, and I felt like if I reached one person today, you know, if I talk today, and they can relate to me and I can relate to them because most of you guys will not relate to me or them, your family members. Uh, Edmund had put up a Facebook post about kicking someone out if they're addicted. My parents, my family never did, thank God. And I wasn't abusive. I mean, there's different situations for every household. If you're gonna be abusive to other people, you can go that route, but I was against it because I was only abusive to myself, never nobody else in my life. So I do think you guys, we're not ourselves when we're on the drug at all. I, I picked the drug over my mother's love and father. The one, and, uh, that, there's no more love in my household than anywhere else. We have a lot of love. so. I chose that drug through that period from 2004 through 2016. 
I was on it for yeah about 12 years. I ended up in the hospital of June 30 of 2016. <coughs> um, for five and a half months, I was in a coma. You know, I got a trach, I got a battery running me. You know, but God is good. God is great. I. I got one of my best friends and cousins here, David. I love him to death. Um, I just want him and me to be together again, like best friends as we always were, you know? And I love him to death. So has Ben, you know, and all my other friends. We're, they're still here and I want to help them, but I didn't think I was strong enough yet because it's, I'm still new. So to be around any of that. So, I mean, God willingly, God willingly, they'll be here with me one day or next year on the same panel. Um, let me just. Twenty sixteen, October thirteenth. I did leave the hospital after five and a half months. Um, I am contributing back to society and my household. Before I was so selfish and would only think about me, me, me not my mom, and I have a newfound respect for women that I love dearly because my mother, which was my enabler, knew everything, every secret of mine. And for those 12 years, she rode with me, you know? My dad knew somewhat, but he was kept, you know, because he didn't have a talent for nothing. He would probably kick me out or kill me. I don't know what he would do, you know, but the women in my life, you know, my sister, my mother, my cousin, my mom, she was there every day with me, a single mother, every day in the hospital with me. I woke up, they were there. Closed my eyes, they were there. So family support is a big key, you know. I never lose faith, you know. Even if you don't recognize your son or daughter, don't lose faith. That's not them, you know. Their mind is contaminated with all that stuff that these gentlemen were talking about and ladies. Uh, October 13th of 2016, my dad threw a party. The day I got out, actually, in this same place, Mitwa, you know. Uh, it was a bit overwhelming, you know. It was. I do want to say that it's an everyday struggle. And two weeks before my birthday this year, I relapsed. But thank God, honestly, thank God, through my family and my cousin's support. I didn't, it was in a controlled environment at the hospital, but still, it, it bothered me. And I've, I lost someone that was close to me and I'm paying for it, which it's okay because now, I honestly can say that I am mentally and physically strong enough to just notify and my loved ones when I'm hurting and when I'm not. So don't have shame if you feel like you're, you need something or you're having a bad day. It happens, you know. I just now will talk it instead of keeping to myself or secrets, you know. I went through it and I just wanna, anyone, anybody that's going through this, you guys can honestly call me and talk to me. If it's your son or daughter, I would love to help because there's a reason why I'm here. I could have been a statistic, you know. I'm here for a reason, and I just want to tell you guys that it's, it's a lifelong fight, but I'm ready to fight. I was never been a quitter. Thank you.
Um, first and foremost, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank every single one of you uh, being a part of this community. I know this is the first step. It was much needed. Um, Jeff, we, we love you, man. Thank God by his grace you're here with us still. Thank you. Um, I've known you all my life. You're an amazing kid from an amazing family. Thank you. God bless you, and we're privileged that you're here with us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Angelo. Um, so, growing up in Chicago, we all see that. I've had so many friends pass away. I have friends currently in jail, and I have friends and family that are in and out of jail. If you go to treatment, those in-home treatments where you're gone for 28 days or 30 days, and then they release you into the care of your family. Are you considered cured? Are you considered cured? If Is you, there any other treatment that needs to be done? Or if you are you to, okay to join society? How long after? You, would you? He, he's saying basically if you've done inpatient treatment, are you, are you cured? Is it? No. No. It's, you, they advise you to at least go through the 90 days, 90 meetings, 90 days, you know which is tough, you know. I wouldn't advise going to a, a heroin. I would rather advise them going to a AA meeting because you do meet other people, you know, if you were on heroin or opiates. And the, 30 days wasn't enough for me. I ended up in the hospital, you know. If I didn't end up in the hospital, I probably wouldn't even be here, you know, honestly. I was a lucky case, but after rehab, you would have to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. That helps your chances. Statistics are bad. So, I mean, but it's still, if you have faith, good family, you know, faith is everything. You know, the 90 days, I do advise that because 30 wasn't enough for me, people 60 days. But it's, it's all about red flags and green flags. You know, you gotta know where there's red flags. You know, I used to have it in my room on the door. I don't know how we moved. It's not there no more, but I had red flags posted on my door every time I would open it and close it before I left for work or something. The green flags, you know them. You're not fearing nothing, you know. But as someone said earlier, after the 30 days, slowly people start creeping in your life again from your past. And, that, you know, and I, you notice that, you feel it. That's why it's, I like to be alone, most of travel alone. I don't like putting myself, I like driving to places myself because I don't want to get stuck anywhere where my past will catch up to me so I can leave right away, you know? And that's how I am now. So I try to always be mobile where myself, if I do see red flags, I shoot out of there as quick as possible, you know? But yeah, definitely, yeah. it's a lifetime, it's, it's a struggle, dude. You need 90 days. At least. I have a question from my... No, 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 just for, to, oh, for, uh, for the same question, I want to add something. You know, the definition of addiction also, as we said, is a disease model. So we call it is a chronic, progressive, relapsing disease. Okay? So it's not some like a, a cold or a, even appendicitis, you do surgery and it's over. No. It's a chronic, it's lifetime disease, unfortunately, okay? And as he, when we go, he went through his uh, history, you saw that he had several relapses. That's the nature of this disease. You will see several relapses and remissions. So that's why the more they be in contact with treatment, the more they be motiv motivated with the treatment, the, it, it will be better. Just like somebody who has diabetes, should lifetime be in time with his uh, uh, primary care, taking medication, doing blood work, exercise, everything. This is a disease model, and this is one of those kind of diseases, especially opiate and heroin. Just, you know, and again, you know, people who get to, get to experience residential, it's important, but, you know, they, every good residential treatment program will start working with a person on transferring to an outpatient program upon their completion. Um, you know, the 90 and 90 you mentioned is, is huge because that's, statistics all show that, that it's supportive, but the other thing that's part of it is that once you start going to that many meetings, it becomes part of your lifestyle. The, the thing about the, the chronic portion of this disease that it's lifelong means that the cure has to be lifelong too. Yeah. 
people don't stop going to meetings. They may go less often, less frequently, whatever, but, but it's still part of their life. Thank you. I should go with this. Um, not to mention about the biological effect of the drugs, and uh, I saw the word dopamine, which, right. you know, some, uh, I studied a little bit, you know, I took a class of addictive behavior, uh, but my question would be, uh, you said that drug changed the system, which, <coughs> from what I know, is that it will affect the release of the dopamine that makes makes you feel high and happy at the moment and then when you stop taking your your uh, system your brain your nerve system will ask for more so you know you can get you to that level that you are taking that medicine exactly. so my, my question would be uh, how long or how, how many like yeah how long you think that uh, uh, you need so the system will change, that you, can, you cannot go back to your normal. Like I know from one pill probably, you know, you take one pill, I don't know if that will right away change your system or like you need few, you know, six, seven or eight. Uh, doctor mentioned at the beginning that, you know, this started from, you know, pushing the, the pain medicine and then that affected, you know, uh, 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 on the long run how people start taking other uh, 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 drug uh, uh, medicines that are more powerful. Sure. So, yeah, how long it take for the medicine to change that balance in your system and your biological or brain? It, it depends on the drug abuse and the most importantly depends on the person, the genetic predisposition, as we said. Again, we don't want to take it as a chance, but not every single person will get addicted. But with the newer drugs, there, there is higher risk because as uh, Dr. Elman mentioned, now, whatever is in the market, it's not as simple. They are mixing so many things with that. So uh, the question is that how many drugs a person should take in order to get addicted, it depends on the person. We, we don't see with the fir uh, first one, but many times after the first one, is that much uh, withdrawal bad that they seek the second one? And mostly, as we know, in the form of a kinetic, after the five doses of a medication or the, the drugs, usually that's, uh, the person will receive a blood level of that, that it's almost therapeutic. So I will say in, in um, average, four or five times, abuse of a drug usually will start a catastrophe. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And then to add on the, on the back end, after you've had some degree of rehab and, and, and such, it, it very well could be the case that you could actually be on medication to help sort of keep the urge and addiction in check. And it is essentially a, a similar type of drug, but it's formulated in a way that you don't get quite the same high. And when under the care of the appropriate you know, addiction specialists and such, it can be safely taken. And frankly, there are patients that will be on those drugs for the rest of their lives. Now, that's not to say that they potentially couldn't come off of them, um, but it, it's very sort of idiosyncratic and it depends to some extent on the patient and uh, the situation. But um, from a medical and disease perspective, um, you'd rather have a patient on a medication <coughs> that's self-suppressing their urges than them relapsing and, you know, frankly, ending up, you know, with a medical complication and or death. Um, and, and so there is nothing wrong with that. Um, but in terms of the part of the reason why it is a chronic disease that is relapsing, doesn't go away, hints, you know, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Literally, the brain is remodeling. The, 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 the connections in the brain are changed by using the drugs. And, and so to some extent, some of that, you know, changes back to some extent, but but largely, it, it, it's, you're, you're always having to fight the, these sort of new pathways in the brain. And that's why you, you continue to get these urges for that drug, because it's just so addictive. You can continue to have that sort of 
feeling that urge even years later, like, wow, if, if something reminds you or an event or a, you know, a situation, a smell, a smell or, or something like that. And so it's incredibly you know, great that like, you, you know, that anyone in that situation, you recognize that you know, when a situation is sort of prompting that and you remove yourself from that situation to be able to sort of help manage it. Um, but you know, that, is, that, that is just the reality. The brain is a different brain after you use drugs. And it, it really can just be a few uses. سيجان مايكل ثمانية أربعة شوا ترى أشوا شوا ثمانية أشوا سيبر سيبر. أنا تلاخن مرة شاكر أنا نقيت له شيء تأيد شخصية من البرد أينوخن وقع خامة أينوخن سلامة سيجان مايكل هازر إلى إتقابة شو المرانة وعند إلى رتنا سبيشالست. سيجان مايكل برقلي للبانة أسيو تجسوب شيكاغو ويسكونسن إلى بورد سيرتيفايد وطلعت بمات شو جي شيكاغو نايلز فيرنين هيلز ويستاك. سيجان مايكل إلى خ خلمة من أنصر عطوراية وعند شيء مقر خلمة ليزر سيرجري وارهاد خبرتنا سيرجري جوا فيزو. Mid America Furniture's new location, 7546 North Milwaukee Avenue in Chicago. Mid America Furniture, special prices for the holidays, now specials on sofas, sleepers, and Ashley mattresses. New collection on dining tables and bedrooms starting at $6.99. Mid America Furniture, we're going to have a lot of money for the ministry. signature by Ashley, Millennium, Benchcraft, Sierra Sleep, Coaster, Jackson, Catnapper, Global Furniture, USA, Pulaski. It's new financing available, a line of furniture, 50% off. Her head is a teacher on Monday through Saturday from 10 to 6, who Sunday man had this at her Hamsha. Ask for Mr. G for an extra 5% off. Mid America Furniture 773-761-2106. خیلی مخه بدی بشه قانع خانم من خا آخر زخات دیلی بتهای قانع خانم من سنخر تونی کالگراکس آن بتوان لچک ایمیل سر هدف زیه ولی قانع خون لیگل ادвайس چه شبته؟ این اتلاع خون اخنا خون خش ما سنقیات قانون و دن ایمیل ات tsk@kalola.com. هدی بشه قانع خون من ده آخر زه تونی کالگراکس. خیلی مخه به تپ دیا شبته ایل باس ورکرز کامپنسیشن. Workers' compensation deals with injuries during the course of employment. For example, slip and fall, lifting heavy boxes, whether you get hurt on your shoulder or your back, stuff like that. The number one rule with the workers' compensation case is to notify your employer. injured during the course of work. There's two ways you could go about doing it, written or orally. Written is via fax or email or an incident report that your employer has. But you have to let the job know you are injured. That's the number one thing. If it's very serious, we recommend you get an ambulance, whether it's your employer calling in or yourself, so you can seek the medical attention you need. Now, during the course of your tenure with regards to getting treatment, you're entitled to two doctors of your own, or you could attend to the employer's doctor. It's up to you. If you do seek uh, to seek the doctors of your choice, we have to put it in court so we could get the approval from the Workers' Compensation Commission. If your doctor renders you disabled or permanently disabled, we can obtain 66% of your wages while you wait to return to work. Manai 66% zuzi diokhani shakleto no agushula masak shakleklu while you're getting treated for the injuries you sustained. At the end of the case, we can also get a lump sum. Lump sum deals with the percentage of how much you were injured compared to the amount of how much you make. Now, as always, the ultimate goal is to put you in the same position as you were prior to this ever taking place. Our number one concern is for you to get your health back. If you guys have questions, concerns, or comments regarding workers' compensation, feel free to give me a call. Again, 847 982-9516. We have offices in downtown Chicago and the suburbs close to you. Thank you. We all have that one person we call, no matter what the situation or event. Who do you call when you've had a stressful day at work? When you get the news that you're having your first child or that you landed your dream job? Now, what if you or a loved one have been injured and need advice? Who do you call? 
Think about it. Um, I just want to first say that I knew the young man that passed away in Arizona also. Um, I was there for the funeral and I want to make sure that his mother, while she was there, stated that her voice is going to be heard regarding the situation. So I want to make sure that she knows that, you know, your voice will be heard. We're going to do our best to make sure that nothing like that happens again. Um, <laughs> for uh, Dr. Ebo and Dr. Gideon, um, working together with other healthcare providers, um, at the pharmacy we have something that's available which is called the Prescription Monitoring Program. So the state of Illinois reports any information in regards to controlled substances that are being picked up, from where they're being picked up, the quantities that are being dispensed, and the pharmacy that's dispensing them. Um, in your practices, do you guys use that prescription monitoring program? And how do we make sure that every other healthcare provider in our, in our state is using that before they end up prescribing any of these controlled substances to make sure that the abuse and the di diversion doesn't occur the way that it's been? Yes, uh, Dr. Tim, we do use it, uh, especially for any new patient that wants to start our, our job when they get like stimulants or when we want to give some benzo. These are main things that we see uh, um, for our patients. And the other thing is that uh, we uh, um, uh, maintenance we look at those. In the state of Illinois, still is not the law for every single prescription. We go and look at that. Although that's a good practice, and we are going towards that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a great question. Um, I, I sort of hinted <coughs> in the beginning, or more than hinted, the, the, the medical community is, you, you know, a, a large um, partly a large part of the problem to some extent, and obviously we're trying to become part of the solution. The, but the, the changes in prescription and narcotic use that occurred in the 90s, um, we, we actually have to unlearn and, and change. Um, I do think that now the training in medical schools and residency programs um, is starting to reshape practice patterns. But it, it's still common, frankly, that if you were to have a minor procedure um, that you could you know, easily be discharged with some Percocet or some morphine or some oxycodone. I will say, if it is a small, minor procedure, um, and even some major procedures, you really don't need narcotics post-operatively. You can, you can manage that pain with anti-inflammatory medications. You have to take them around the clock for 24 to 48 hours, but that's the worst of it, and, and it's totally doable. Um, and I would encourage everyone to, to um, only use those narcotics. If, if someone were to give you that prescription, I'd, I'd encourage you, if you had a small procedure, to only use them as a last resort. Um, and then, like Ramson Kasha was saying, to, um, to uh, uh, get rid of any extras as much as possible, don't fill the full prescription, these kinds of things. Um, to speak to the reporting system, so the reporting system is fairly new. It's a, it's a very good development. Um, as Dr. Giuliana said, I don't think it's um, uh, universally being used. I think it depends potentially on the um, clinician or the, the institution. Um, uh, you know, certainly if, if you are the care provider for an individual patient and you're in a primary care relationship, you, you, um, you probably, at that point, um, you, you know, if, if the person is sort of pain medication naive, you, probably, you might be the person who's the first instance of giving them a narcotic. It, if on the other hand, the patient is on chronic narcotics, it, it becomes fairly easy to detect when a patient is starting to have problems with chronic narcotics. And in those situations, um, I think um, th th that's being said, I haven't been in practice for the past year because I've been in more on the administrative side, but I think it's now increasingly common to go to the website and look up patients when you're having sort of red flags that there's a concern. But um, I don't think it's still being universally used. I, I, certainly also I will say that it's the case that insurance companies are now implementing rules around um, you know, paying for the narcotics, especially when they're fresh prescriptions. You have to have, there, there's more control over having <coughs> a, 
um, authorizations and stuff to be able to be on these narcotics chronically at high doses. That said, um, like, it, it really is, I'm much more concerned actually about the naive user who's using it for the first time and slightly recreationally or whatever thinks it's cool or fun. And, and it's that user who then after two or three doses is now you know, seeking it out and getting it from other more illicit sources. And, and so I really encourage you to, you know, just, you know, do everything you can to avoid the narcotic. Think of it as poison. Thank you. Mid-America Furniture's new location, 7546 North Milwaukee Avenue in Chicago. Mid-America Furniture's special prices for the holidays, now specials on sofas, sleepers, and Ashley mattresses. New collection on dining tables and bedrooms starting at $6.99. Mid-America Furniture, we're going to have a lot of money for the Ministry of the Ministry. The signature by Ashley, Millennium, Benchcraft, Sierra Sleep, Coaster, Jackson, Catnapper, Global Furniture, USA, Pulaski. It's new financing available, line of furniture, a 50% off. Her had a Tihana Monday through Saturday from ten to six, who Sunday Mun had the Sarah Hamsha. Ask for Mr. G for an extra five percent off. Mid America Furniture seven seven three seven six one two one zero six.